Well, I'm glad you could join us once again for the Midway Baptist Church of Athens, Alabama Adult Sunday School lesson. And it's our prayer that you'll receive a blessing uh, from the lesson. Uh, we have Sunday School live each Sunday morning at 10 a.m., uh, typically in our admin building right now because of some renovations. We're having Sunday School in the Family Life Center, but we hope you'll be able to join us live. If not, uh, we continue to record our lessons and place them on YouTube so that you can uh, watch the lesson on YouTube as well. They're available also at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. Our worship services are live We uh, from our sanctuary at 11 a.m. each Sunday. We hope that you'll be able to join us for worship, but if you're unable to do that, uh, we also are live streaming those worship services on Facebook and uh, also recording them, placing them on YouTube, uh, typically later on Sunday so that you can uh, avail yourself of uh, a time of worship with us and uh, don't forget on wednesday evenings uh, doc overholt continues to lead us in a study of the tabernacle we meet in our admin building typically but right now again it'll be in the family life center uh, for that study at 6 p.m each wednesday uh, those are also live streamed if you can't join us live and also are placed on youtube uh, so that you can watch them there as well uh, let's uh, open with prayer. Father, I thank you for your word, Father, and for the time that you've given us to read and study it. Thank you, Father, for our salvation, for our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for the work that he did on the cross to enable us to have our sins forgiven, Father, and to give us eternal life. I pray, Father, for your blessings on uh, this time that we spend together. I pray, Father, for the Holy Spirit to teach us what you would have us to understand and understand and to know pray that you'll guide our thoughts and our words uh, as we spend time together. Pray, Father, above all, that you'll be pleased, honored, and glorified and magnified by everything that we say and everything that we do. I just pray, Father, that you'll bless our time of study together. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, our lesson uh, today, uh, title is Values, and our focal passages will be from Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 20 and 21, also Ezekiel 23, verses 36 to 39, and uh, also Psalms uh, 139, verses 13 through 16. And this is the lesson for January 16th of 2022. Uh, Christopher DeVink grew up at home with a brother whose name was Oliver. Oliver lay on his back in bed for more than 32 years. Uh, Oliver couldn't speak, he couldn't learn, he couldn't walk, he couldn't even lift his head. He was born with severe brain damage and grew to the size of a 10-year-old, but in, in a permanent state of helplessness for his entire life. He could only breathe, sleep, and eat. The whole family participated in his care. They fed him, they bathed him, they changed his underwear, they kept him warm. Christopher remembered his mother telling him how the family was blessed with Oliver in ways that weren't clear to her at first. He recalled her telling him that when he met Oliver in heaven, Oliver would run and hug him and say thank you. When Oliver died in 1980, the minister at his funeral reminded those who attended that uh, life too often is unvalued or undervalued. That year, worldwide, there were an estimated 40 million uh, abortions performed. Since 1973, when Roe v. Wade was passed uh, worldwide, there have been more than 1.8 billion abortions. And in the United States, there have been over 63 million abortions since 1973. Our world constantly attempts to alter reality in order to shape it to whatever provides the greatest profit or convenience or pleasure for them. But Oliver and his family proved that regardless of how helpless we may feel, we have the ability to nurture all that grows around us. God values every human life, weak and strong, born and unborn, because he created each of us in his image. In our culture today, our values not only shape our priorities, but they also shape uh, the way that we value people. 
but we have to remember that to God, all lives matter. All lives are valuable to him. How can a person's values get in the way of treating others with dignity? Well, if we think about uh, the way our society is today, it's filled with a great deal of selfishness. Uh, one of the things that I thought of as I studied the lesson was the recent reports on airline attendants uh, being assaulted uh, in, and violent incidents occurring on airplanes where arguments ensued over masks or even over uh, someone having to sit next to a mother with a child that might cry and disturb them. Uh, valuing others should be a vital characteristic of each believer and we should ne never uh, re remove value from anyone uh, regardless of who they might be. Today we observe the sanctity of life. In our passages from Ezekiel and from Psalms uh, we'll find that they are consistent in expressing God's value of human life. God reminded his people that humans are created in his image and therefore they are all valued by him. The children of Israel had had a habit of uh, pursuing the practices uh, of their neighbors, the people who uh, lived in Canaan after they uh, came into the promised land. Baal worship was common. Worship of Molech was also common and uh, included the sacrifice of children. The Moabite god of Chemosh was also served uh, by making human sacrifices. The Judeans who had been exiled, uh, we find what some of them would also be uh, influenced by the Babylonian gods as well. Um, we, as we read our first passage, I want you to listen for the evil practices that the Israelites had adopted from their neighbors. And we're going to begin by reading Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 20 and 21. Ezekiel 16, 20 and 21. Moreover, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Uh, were your acts of harlotry a small matter that you have slain my children and offered them up to them by causing them to pass through the fire? <clears throat> So we find uh, in this passage that uh, <clears throat> we're told about the evil practices that the Israelites had adopted uh, from their neighbors in the land of Canaan. Uh, they sacrificed their daughters and their sons. Uh, and it talks about them being devoured. They, they believed that these child sacrifices were food for Molech uh, or other idolatrous gods. The acts of harlotry that are told about in, these, in this passage, uh, because the pagan religions practiced prostitution, uh, the Israelites' uh, participation in those practices was considered harlotry by God. Uh, because the Israelites were worshiping idols, God considered them as prostituting themselves to idols instead of worshiping him. So it was twofold, this this prostitution or this harlotry. And then it talks about passing through the fire and it talks about uh, the sacrifice of the sons and daughters and passing through the fire. One of my commentaries stated, and I'm going to quote, scholars do not know precisely how parents caused their children to pass through the fire, but some believe the children were thrown into a raging flame. Some ancient records indicate the children were placed in a hollow bronze statue of the body of a human and the head of an ox. A fire was then built below the statue and sacrificial drums were pounded to drown out the children's cries. In either case, the children died a gruesome death. So what angered God was the idol worship of the cult god Molech. God had explicitly forbidden that to take place. And I want to share with you uh, where he talks about that in in uh, Leviticus chapter 18. We're going to read Leviticus, Leviticus 18, uh, verse 21, single verse. And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am 
the Lord. So God was very clear about what he was forbidding uh, the nation of Israel to do. The Israelites had turned their backs on God and had begun worshiping idols. Molech was one. We talked about Baal being the other uh, as well. Some believed these gods, some of the Israelites believed these gods uh, could provide fertility for their crops and for their bodies as well, and that uh, God was unable to do that. They felt like uh, because this land of Canaan was flowing with milk and honey that it had to do with these uh, false gods, these idols that were worshipped there. They had forgotten or ignored how gracious and loving God had been toward them, and the covenant that he had made with them had became, become uh, forgotten by them. How would you characterize this kind of logic of uh, sacrificing a child in order to gain favor with a so-called God? And do we see that same kind of logic today? Uh, I thought about in Islam and their jihad and uh, the, the suicide bombers that we see and that they killed many, but they were guaranteed blessings. They are guaranteed blessings from Allah. So that same sort of logic still exists uh, in, in our world today. What are the dangers of forgetting all the blessings that God has given us, including our children? Uh, many, many of us don't count our blessings. Someone uh, said to me a few weeks ago that they had heard, uh, I guess on the radio, uh, that if you only uh, said that you were thankful uh, for certain things, if you only thank God today for a few things, uh, knowing that that's all you would have tomorrow, how much would you have? So we need to be very thankful for the ways that God has blessed us. He has given us innumerable blessings in our lives. We need to be thankful to him for that because he does provide for us. Uh, many don't count their blessings, but they count impositions on their chosen lifestyle and upon what they consider to be their rights. As we read our next passage, listen for uh, the depraved condition of Israel that was identified by their bizarre and sinful behavior. We're going to look at Ezekiel 23, verses 36 through 39. Ezekiel 23, verses 36 through 39. The Lord also said to me, Son of man, will you judge Ahola and Aholibah? Uh, then declare to them their abominations, for they have committed adultery, and blood is on their hands. They have committed adultery with their idols, and even sacrificed their sons, whom they bore to me, passing them through the fire to devour them. Moreover, they have done this to me. They have defiled my sanctuary on the same day, and profaned my Sabbaths, for after they had slain their children to, for their idols, on the same day they came into my sanctuary to profane it, and indeed thus they have done in the midst of my house. So what was their bizarre and sinful behavior? Uh, God lists it here, adultery, uh, and that adultery occurred within marriages. Uh, it also occurred because of temple prostitutes at the places where they worship these idols. It talks about blood on their hands. Uh, this has to do with the, with the killing of their children. Uh, they committed adultery uh, by worshiping idols. God considered that to be spiritual adultery as well. Uh, and they sacrificed their children to those idols by burning them. Defiling the sanctuary, violating the Sabbath, Sabbath uh, was symbolized uh, in two ways. You'll note that in what we just read, it talked about Ahola. Uh, and if you were to look at the earlier verses, especially verse 4 of chapter 23 of Ezekiel, you'll find that it tells us what Oha Ahola symbolized. It symbolized the northern kingdom. Aholiba symbolized the southern kingdom. Again, if you look at this same chapter, Ezekiel 23, verse 4, it tells us that Aholiba symbolized the southern kingdom. Uh, the early verses of chapter 3 describe uh, the sins. Verses 5 through 10 
describes the sins from. For the northern kingdom, Ahola, and verses 11 through 21 of this 23rd chapter of Ezekiel describe the sins of the southern kingdom. And it specifically tells us that although the northern kingdom was uh, first conquered by the Assyrians in 722 B.C., and they were exiled and other people were brought into that northern kingdom, southern kingdom uh, was not completely conquered until 586 B.C., uh, which is, uh, you know, over 100 years later, and yet they didn't pay attention to the way that God judged the northern kingdom. And uh, the scripture tells us that their sins were even worse than the northern kingdom. Uh, verses 22 through 35 of that same 23rd chapter of Ezekiel tell us of God's judgment coming upon the southern kingdom. So what was the attitude of the two sisters that represented or symbolized these two kingdoms? They were callous and they turned their backs on God. As I studied how they worshipped idols and sacrificed their children, uh, they went to the temple and they thought that because they came there, they were okay in their relationship. And God talks about the fact that they profaned the Sabbath, that they paid no attention to the Sabbath. I thought of, uh, at that time, part of the lyrics of uh, a little Jimmy Dickens song. Some of you may know who that was. Uh, the name of the song was I'm a Plain Old Country Boy. And the chorus on that song uh, says, I raise Cain on Saturday, but I go to church on Sunday. How often do we do that? How often do we uh, live our lives during the week uh, without giving God even a thought? And then just by attending uh, church service on Sunday, we feel everything is okay. For some, that's just a normal cycle. But maybe that's almost as bizarre as what Israel was doing. That's not the way that God would have us to live as, as his children. He would have us to live consistent lives. Uh, and that as we live our consistent lives, that we would center our lives around his will and his purpose. How does repeating a sin cause a person in our society to become callous and, and uh, commit greater sins? Um, one of the things that I thought of as I studied is I had read years ago that uh, when we think about the generations, it says what one generation permits, something new that is permitted by one generation, the next generation accepts. And so we find that from generation to generation, if that saying is true, and I believe that it is, that, uh, that our uh, values actually degrade from generation to generation. If we just permit something to happen in our generation, the next generation is going to think that it's normal behavior, not uh, uh, not just occasional behavior or a behavior that should not be tolerated. So uh, we our behavior is sinful in this generation. The next generation will even be more sinful. We see that happening in the nation of Israel. We can see that that also has happened in our nation. Can a person be so accustomed to sin that they no longer feel guilty when they sin, I believe that we can. I believe that people can become so accustomed to a sinful lifestyle that they have no sense of guilt uh, for their sinful behavior. So what safeguards can you put in place to keep from being becoming so calloused uh, towards sin? I believe that uh, the things that we need to put in our life, number one, is God's word, that we need to read it, we need to study it, we need to hear it preached, we need to hear it taught, uh, but primarily what we need to do is we need to heed God's word. We need to be obedient to what God's word says. And I believe also that we need to be accountable uh, to others. Certainly we're going to be accountable to God one day, but we need to be accountable to each other as well. I'm going to read Psalm 139, uh, 13 through 16, very slowly, and I want you to think about the significance of each of the phrases as I read it. Psalm 139, uh, verses 13 through 16. 
for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So when we think about those phrases, we should be inspired by the fact that God loved us, cared for us, even before we were born. He had a purpose for us when we were first conceived. And it talks about in these verses that he had uh, this written in the book. One of my commentaries said, God already had a blueprint of our life at the time that we were conceived. Uh, I wanted to share something with you that's actually in your uh, in your uh, study guide or your quarterly. Uh, it's actually on page 71 in your quarterly uh, at the top of that page, and I'm just going to quote it and read it here. God's salvation is based on God's value of human life. Peter declared that God desires no one to perish, but all to come to repentance. That's in 2 Peter 3, 9. He gave his son for this very purpose. God is not a discriminator of persons. He loves all people, 1 John 4, 9. Paul wrote that God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that's uh, Romans 5, 8. So we we can think about God's relationship to us and how much he loves us uh, and that he, uh, he knew us before we were born. He still knows us. He wants to have an intimate relationship with us. He wants us to be one of his uh, children and to worship him in spirit and in truth. Christ died for all people and his example demonstrates the value of every person, no matter their age or their gender or race, ethnicity, we should always seek to affirm the value of others as God's creation. So the theme for our lesson today has been that God values all human life. The prophet Ezekiel was called by God to confront Israel uh, in their worship of idols and for devaluing human life as they sacrifice their children. The psalmist David stated that God plans the conception of every child and gives each person distinct qualities and purposes for his glory. Let's close with prayer. Father, I thank you for your word and for this time you've given us. Thank you, Father, that you love us so much that you gave your son and sacrificed him uh, to provide us with uh, with salvation father to provide us with eternal life i pray father for the ones who are contemplating abortion uh, today father that uh, whether they're contemplating aborting a child or they're contemplating suicide or they're contemplating euthanasia father that they'll seek god's guidance and that they'll understand his love for them and the fact that he has a purpose for them and that you have a purpose for each of us, Father, we know that. Uh, pray, Father, for our church that we would uh, reach out into this community and be salt and light here in Athens. I pray for Brother Jerome as he brings the message to us that you've given to him for us, that we'll have open hearts and minds, that we'll receive it. And that, Father, uh, having received it, that we'll leave this place being uh, doers of your word, not hearers only. Uh, pray, Father, that uh, you would be with those who are on our prayer list. Father, those who are ill, those who have other issues in life, those who are suffering, Father, I just pray that you would place your healing hand upon them according to your will. Pray, Father, that you'll guide us, direct us in the ways you'd have us to go. Help us that we might serve you faithfully. Help us, Father, that we might 
continue to love you uh, as you have loved us. Forgive us, Father, for our sins. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining us for our lesson. And until we meet again, may the good Lord bless and keep you.